Welcome everyone to Something Up My Sleeve and Happy New Year. This is the first edition of 2024. So excited that now we are in our third season, our third year of this amazing talk show where I get to interview magicians from all over the world and bring some behind the scenes talk to you guys. So thank you so much for the IBM for sponsoring this. In fact, I'm going to make sure that the logo is prevalent throughout this portion of the show. So if you're unfamiliar with it, please check out the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Go to their website, go to the Facebook page. You'll see some of the previous episodes of the show and other fun content. And if you're interested in getting involved in magic, that is the perfect place to be. I'm so excited to bring you our first guest of 2024. In high school, I fell in love with motorsports, motorcycles, dirt bikes. I'm definitely an adrenaline junkie. But one day, I saw a magician put a Sharpie in his nose, and I thought, this is what I want to do with my life. When I was 14, I discovered the world of Harry Houdini. I got into escapes. I was a weird kid that tied herself to a chair in the hallway. I didn't even know how to get out, or if I could get out. But I figured that if I had 1,400 people staring at me, there would be a way. Yeah. My parents probably got the hint when I started asking for handcuffs for Christmas. I think it was the straight jacket. That's definitely what got my mom nervous. She's like, yeah, that's great. It just, it's not for you. You know, do a card trick. You don't need to tie yourself up. They came around when I think they realized there wasn't anything they could do to stop me. I didn't want to do something that everyone else in the world could do or learn to do. I wanted to do something that was uniquely me. She has achieved so much in such a short period of time, having been on Foolish, performing at the Magic Castle at Chicago Magic Lounge, and many more accolades. So please, and also social media for the International Brotherhood of Magicians, please welcome to the show, Gabriella Lester. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome. I'm so glad to have you here. I have actually wanted to have you as a part of this for a while, and I knew that because you're involved so heavily with the IBM, that, you know, I kind of had you in my back pocket because I knew that you couldn't say no because you're so involved with the idea. You didn't have a choice. You would have to agree to be on the show. So I knew that I could I could get a hold of you and that you'd be a part of it. But uh, really, when you think about uh, who's really making a name for themselves in magic, who better to interview than you? Because I am so impressed. Thank you with everything that you have achieved over the last year. Uh, I'm going to tell you in a moment about my most impressed, the most impressed I've been. I'll tell you about that moment so you can share. Uh, but oh, first, no. I, so I don't get ahead of myself or get out of order, which I always do because of my ADD. I want to ask you the first question I ask everyone, which is what is something up your sleeve? Well, at the moment, I have nothing up my sleeve, but I do have these really funky pajama pants and I'm going to pretend like I'm not wearing Oh, so you could pull, well, you could pull something out of your uh, leg sleeve as well. I or, probably is that, did. Is, is, is that a word? Leg sleeve? Is that, if it's yeah. leg of a, uh, maybe not, we'll, we'll start it. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Metaphorically speaking. Metaphorically uh, in my pajama leg sleeves. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm home right now, but working on some stuff for the new year. Do you, we can get into that. Well, yeah, but I mean, uh, yeah. metaphorically, what what do you bring to the table, or what makes what do you feel makes you uh, not just any entertainer, not just any magician, but what makes you you? Oh yeah, um, no, I I feel like I bring a new perspective to the world of magic. I mean, I take everything that I've seen in history. I'm a huge history nerd in the realm of magic, so for me, I get to take all the beautiful chunks of history and bring them into the future and try to make them new and unique and see what's worked in the past but put a modern twist on it. So for me, I, I get to be an evolving version of myself because I'm growing as an artist as I am as a performer at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting, because that's ex that's exactly what I read about you, which was, I believe, um, a letter from Gay Blackstone talking about your performance and talking about how you take bits of history and, and give it a modern spin and present it in a way that nobody has seen, uh, which is an incredible accolade just to hear from her about your performance. Um, but uh, great response. Uh, so what were you going to say about what are your goals for the new year or what you're hoping to achieve? 
Yeah, like I've got a couple of things on the block for this year. I've just started working on a, a TV show that we'll hopefully be filming within the next few months, just in the creative stages of creating something. And uh, to tie in with what I said before, it's taking a lot of those elements of what everything that's been done within the world of magic that's been really successful. And how do we make it a new thing? You know, how do we take before Houdini straitjacket and Houdini water torture cells? They didn't exist. He created them. So how can we use the tools that he did in the present time and create things that are the Gabriella Lester this and that? So. Uh, any any chance we get something a little more specific as to a particular effect or routine you're working on? Uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of. We want to put the, the the bikes in the show in some regard and then look at the world and the state it's in and try and take certain elements of that, which would be electronics and AI and self-driving cars and try and incorporate things that are already being talked about and put them into magic. So, Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, so like... Uh... A uh, trick with a Tesla. Maybe. Okay, nice. Um, so I want to talk about your Foolish performance because I think what was so impressive was that at a, at a young age, you presented so much confidence. And what my main question is, did they comment at all about how confident you were? It seemed like even Allison was impressed. But was there? did they say anything to you about, like, did you – surprise them with your confidence yeah i mean i'm not even sure because it was COVID time so i didn't even speak to them afterwards so it was really just what they said in response and then i left and that was that and so only a portion of that made it on air so as to what the other comments were i don't even remember i blacked out through pretty much all of their interaction with me like i didn't even catch on to any code words i remember they spoke and i was like i paused and i i need I have no idea anything like I was so in the space and just coming out of it that I forgot everything that they said. And then, you know, we talked about the effect and I left. So in terms of, of compliments, I, I don't even remember any of it. I didn't even feel confident within that performance of it. I was in such really? a, a nervous headspace of it that I walked out, I did it, I left and it was like, okay, now maybe I can breathe a little and move on with life. But I did not feel confident. You brought so much confidence. It appeared that you controlled the room. And I can't imagine, I can't even name many performers that in the presence of Penn and Teller could do that, could actually present that, is it, whether they are or not internally controlling the room. And I totally felt that that's what you did and that they were just at your whim. Uh, so that was an incredible accomplishment. Now going into it, did you believe you were going to, you'd be able to fool them or did you believe you would impress them? Um, I mean, Sean was a huge part in, Sean Barker was a huge part in creating that effect. So a lot of the elements that we added were towards the direction of fooling them. So there were a lot of, you know, if they think this or say this or think these things that we will, and we did have kind of a good inkling and hope towards that direction, but you you never really know with the show where it's going to go. Um, so we did have a good feeling, but it was about 50, 50 with those things on what was going to happen. But at the end of the day, it was a great experience. I hope I impressed them. I hope they were entertained and that's all it can be. Now at the time of recording this, it is a uh, submission time. Uh, we've seen a, a couple of, uh, post and whatnot in the magic world about the fact that the next season is happening and they're encouraging magicians to submit. Do you have any intention of trying something new on that particular show or resubmitting? Yeah. I mean, I've talked to the guys and I've thought about it. Um, you know, you never know how many seasons are going to be left of something like this. So right. there might be something in the works. I have to give it some thought. Yeah. Do you, uh, you can clue us into any, any random ideas of uh, what type of effect you might be playing with yeah i honestly i'm in the drawing board of coming up with anything right now i don't have anything in mind that i'm working towards you know last season sean and i talked about doing another effect with the ring um but i i want to do something different so i think we're gonna right now it's scratching on a whiteboard coming up with anything so i'm not sure yet but seems like the biggest challenge is to come up with anything that's not a card trick yeah right? yeah or anything uh, really that's just unique uh, I'm convinced that, that that's been my problem is what I submitted, which is technically a card trick, even though it's sort of like a anti card trick, but it's still a card trick. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm, I'm and unless they just don't like me, I'm, I'm convinced that it's not that they don't like me, uh, that it's just a, it's another card no, trick. I could dislike to, you, Michael. Well, it's right? It's so that's what, right. I Have know. Have you seen that's, the hair? I know. Yeah. And it looks a little darker today. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah. pepper flakes. Yeah. Extra. I'm, I'm well seasoned. 
Yes, Mr. Chicken Wing. Yeah, is that what you that was before we started recording this? But yeah. you called me. You called we me a chicken a wing. In. Yeah. Uh, which Perfectly she meant is a compliment. She yeah. that was a total compliment. So I feel like though I I sort of like reverted back to high school when mm -hmm. other people in like when we were playing dodgeball called me chicken wing, which I don't think they meant it the same way. But I'm gonna take it from you as a compliment. Of yeah, it means I'm well seasoned. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's which let's there. let's speak to that because uh, I am seasoned in that I've had a lot of experience in this industry. Um, what has been your challenges? Because you're, I, I hate to say, but you're pretty young and you've achieved so much having been so young. So without the seasoning, uh, mm -hmm. what has been your challenging? Have, have, have there been times when people don't take you seriously because of your age? A plus transition on the seasoning thing. Yeah, um, that, yeah. but, you know, I, I would say it's been pretty damn great. I'd say for the most part, because I've had the benefit of growing up in the industry with a lot of people that have treated me like family. I haven't really had too many encounters where people, you know, aren't willing to give me the opportunity or take me seriously because they've seen that I'm willing to put in the work. Um, there's obviously rooms that you're in where you're not taken seriously or you have the whole woman in magic element of it. But for the most part, I've been met with an overwhelming abundance of support and love of people that see the effort I'm putting in and want to see me create something great out of it. So I, I, and I have the benefit. I mean, I've worked most of the magic venues in the circuit and have been the youngest performer at almost all of them. And so I've, you know, I've worked my ass off to try and get the opportunities, but I've also been met with a lot of people that were willing to give me the chance to do so. So this is kind of putting you on the spot because you've had uh, a lot of amazing opportunities recently. And uh, many of it, you, you could talk about all of them as just phenomenal experiences. Um, but what stands out in your mind as something that you were really surprised that shocked at or that you just couldn't believe you were a part of yeah i think there's been a lot of really interesting moments where it's felt like i've had a seat at the table where i've worked a venue or been a part of an event or a function or surrounded by a bunch of magicians that i look up to and respect and i've for the most part have always felt included as a peer that i felt level to level where it's never like they're here and i'm listening it's always around the same level and we're conversing um, so I think being a part of conversations where it just felt like I have a seat at the table and people are interested in what I think and my reasoning, and I can just speak passionately and eloquently about magic and history and what I feel like, and just being, you know, respected like that. I've never had to feel like maybe when I'm older, it's just, I've been, you know, I've had a seat at the table since I was 12. That's the coolest thing in the world for me. And which we have, uh, we have video of you at 12 years old doing a straitjacket routine at your high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you mentioned that you felt like you were kind of the oddball and not the cool kid. But how do you how do you do a straitjacket routine in a cafeteria and not be the cool kid at your school? Because it was weird. It was like you it wasn't really enough of something. And you kind of have to take it in a certain direction for them. They're not going to you know see that and go, she's going to be the next Harry Dini. They're going to see that and kind of be what is she doing? And if you're not enough of something, you're going to be weird or strange or unique. You know, so it was. But I was blinded to all of that at the time. You know, I I saw the vision of where I wanted to go and was able to just kind of trek through it. So it was bringing ropes to school and, you know, chains and straight jackets and doing shows in the theater and doing car tricks for a bunch of kids that didn't really want to see them. But it was, you know, you had to have your hamburger of doing those a thousand shows. I did my thousand shows in front of high school students against their will, but it you know, got me moving forward. Which is already a risk because if you show up with a backpack full of chains and ropes and they haven't seen the routine, that's a good reason to just call off school, call the bomb squad or something, right? In this day and age, um, not knowing what to expect from you. But that brings me to a point of there's different elements of magic and you've mastered several, including sleight of hand and cardistry, mm -hmm. but also things that are dangerous, like escapes, things that... For example, I've always leaned toward comedy and never wanted to mess with because I, mm -hmm. I don't like the risky stuff. But you do uh, hanging upside down in a straitjacket, which is very dangerous. So have you considered yourself to be sort of like the bad girl of magic? I mean, that doesn't have a bad ring to it. I, I definitely think I've tried to be more versatile as an artist and kind of tune into who I am as a person and I'm a big adrenaline junkie in life you know with the motorcycles and that and so being able to incorporate them to the magic 
uh, with the escapes and that. But the escapes was, was kind of when it originated, it was drawn from history. It was drawn from my love of the history of magic, especially, you know, with Houdini and going down that path. Um, so it came stemming from the nerdy, historic part of me and the publicity stunt of how do you build a name for yourself without doing things publicly. And then on the other hand was the adrenaline side of things. So I think in a little bit, I have that to me. Um, but then I also have the my passion for card magic and close-up magic and comedy. And so I, I've really been enjoying trying all those different elements, which has been the great thing about getting into it while I'm young. So which came first, the cardistry or the escapes? Cards, yeah. I started with close-up, as, as most kids do. Okay. I mean, my start in magic was in bars like i started with bar bets my brother my older brother played a lot of sports so my family always took us to like whatever the family kind of restaurant pubs were so when i started with card tricks i didn't have an audience and you know i learned almost everything in the beginning from you know brian brushwood's channel scam school yes so i was watching scam school and they were pretty much all bar bets and that was all i knew of the realm of magic so i used to take a deck of cards when i went to my family like without with my family and which is go up to the bar and sit down next to guys watching sports and challenge them in bar bets and then you know like i made for the first year or two of magic i mean i was 11 or 12 at this time but i was making my money from doing bar bets so i got i think that comedic sardonic edge and the comfortable you know behavior on stage from there and then from that it was just kind of an element that i've always had in my back pocket that you know i'm gonna clip that is just a clip on its own and i want to point out that she is canadian as she said i'm i was 11 or 12 but making my money from bar bets <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what's legal in your country here <laughs> people would really be wondering but i think a lot is acceptable in canada maybe that wouldn't go on yeah. here yeah, cute kid with a deck of cards. Yeah, sure. What Just let her into any bar. Yeah, what, so what you can do. Yeah, it's Vancouver, yeah. eh? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so, um, in talking about the dangerous stunts and uh, some of those activities, I've noticed that you have some videos where it could have been somebody just filming with a cell phone, but then you have some amazingly shot videos of like you on the motorcycle. Um, mm -hmm that seemed very professionally shot like it's a music video can you talk a little to that and how that came about of of what type of footage you're getting there yeah i mean all of that stuff kind of acts as b-roll for what i'm working towards creating in the future but a lot of it is just trying to set that brand and image of who i am as an artist and like as an individual and kind of stepping away not necessarily from the magician thing but not that when people think i don't want people to necessarily just think of gabriella lester she's a magician i'd rather be gabriella lester is this human being this public figure that this brand and she does magic and there's this bike element and there's this danger element and there's all these other things that are a part of her as a person not just she's a magician and the person is gabriella Gabriella, if that makes any sense. So I've been working sure. a lot with, you know, videographers and friends out here that are kind of helping me bring that creative vision to life of trying to take my passions and kind of solidifying them into this image that you can see. And now, I mean, I hope when you look at me online, you look at my Instagram, you have a good taste for who I am as a person. And it's got this bite and this edge to it that feels like it has a little bit of depth. So it's been pulling the bikes into that and creating these, these cool things without it being too deep on the sex appeal side of things. Are there any other like hobbies, activities that maybe we, we don't see that are as prevalent? Cause obviously now we know where you're into motorcycles, uh, mm -hmm. you're into the adrenaline rush. Um, you do the straight jacket escape and you're into magic. So what other, are there other, other hobbies or things that you're into that maybe we aren't aware of? Yeah. I mean, I, I still think sometimes my biggest passion in the world is music. I mean, I'm surrounded by my final collection now. Um, so I think the softer side of things is the element of me that is just calm and quiet. I think on social media or in the realm, you don't see the soft centered, sit on the floor, read lyrics, listen to music, journal, write and light a candle version of me, which is a big part of my life too. Um, but I, almost kind of like that that stuff isn't online because that's kind of my getaway and my break that I live this life where I'm on the road and I'm doing shows and I'm riding bikes and setting things on fire and having this but then when I come home I get to have this like just chill element like I get to be level and step away from all that and just be okay with slowing down and breathing um so I have that part of my life that's kind of kept to myself but it's still a huge love of mine so in dealing with the the dangerous aspect did you had the escapes and you play with fire, you do fire eating. Were there any times that you got in trouble at school uh, because of your activities? 
Ah, oh, the only time. Okay, I started a fight club in my high school. You started a fight club? I did. Yeah. So we had this little cement pit outside of my school. In Canada. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just this little pit. And at the time, I think I was doing kickboxing and I was training in the gym at the time. And I was like, oh, it would be so cool to see this thing happen. So I just asked one of my bunch of my buddies, bring gloves or whatever you want to do. And let's just do it for the, I don't know. I didn't really think everything I did through. I just got excited about something you did it, you know, and oh, I'll, I'll send you the videos sometimes. But it was just this, at this point, it was this random thing where it just built crowds of all these kids, kind of like the straight jacket thing is they would be outside surrounding this big cement pit where they used to put the garbage bins. And there'd just be two kids like screaming the heck out of each other. And it was wow. king of the court kind of thing. So whoever won, stay in and go back. And then I don't know where I got it in my head. But like on the last day of doing this or whatever, end of lunch, whatever it was, I like in the last round, I'm like, oh, I'm going to jump in and fight the last guy with like, I took like one kickboxing lesson before this. Let's state this. I have half an hour of punch, punch training. That is it. Um, and so you, I jumped you were like, in. I'm going to take on the boss. Like, you know, freaking black belt kid that's just been in there for an hour. Um, did not go well. I be, like pretty much basically stopped breathing and I had to go to the hospital but only at that point because of that incident did the principal and teachers find out and then I just remember like sitting like holding my entire body waiting to go to the hospital and talking to my principal uh and he's and he just looks at me at that point because he's just seen me done all this crazy stuff and just goes just just why I don't I don't know Todd I don't know (laughs) Okay, that's not what I was expecting. I thought you were going to say, yeah, like, you know, they, I was playing with matches one day. No, like, you're describing something that we know exists, like, in Detroit, not in Vancouver. <laughs> uh, and you've broken the first rule of Fight Club. I, well, I had to <laughs> talking about, about it right now. Uh, no, therapy. I appreciate you revealing this and talking about it. Definitely not what I expected. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to be in a ring with you then if uh, that's your adrenaline rush. But uh, uh, what <laughs> at what age was this? Uh, maybe 10th or 11th grade. So 15, maybe. Okay. And uh, so your own person. Now, did you, was this, was this monetized that were you selling tickets? Was there a betting? No, no, on? it was just Gambling? for fun. Oh, just, just yeah. Fun it was just. Just fun, just knocking the hell out of each other for fun. I get it. It was yeah. a weird. I remember watching hockey games, you know, as a kid, but uh, only just loving the part where they fought. And that was like, I would get yeah. so into that. So I'm like, why not just only do the fighting part? This makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that's that's what people are there for. Yeah, that's what they're there to watch. That makes sense. Wow. Okay. Um. So I think we're we're all relieved that uh, you pursued magic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's and, and it's not prison. Choice. So you were like magic prison. I'm gonna go with sleight of hand. That's yes, that's and now I can do choice. magic in prison, and it's yeah. Oh, that that'll keep you out of trouble. Yeah, that'll help you to avoid the Fight Club. Oh, don't yeah. don't hit her. She does card tricks. <laughs> right. We need our jester. Leave her alone. Yeah. Wow. We need our jester. <laughs> She's the funny one. Yeah, she does card tricks for us. Yeah. yeah. No, don't punch her. Leave her. Yeah. And, <laughs> But uh, good to know you can hold your own. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so <laughs> one question I had is, what is your go-to? So especially in a situation that you know you're walking into, uh, maybe they don't know who you are. Maybe they expect that. What is What does this girl know about magic? What is she going to do? What is your go-to effect that you know is going to win the crowd over? Yeah, uh, I mean, the one I post about more is the one that I do the most, uh, which is the chain cuff routine. And I I love that because it has the elements of escape without danger. You're not watching because I'm risking my life, but it's got that little bit of a bite to it. And the interesting thing about that and why it has such an important part of my show is when I do that, I pick the two biggest, bulkiest dudes, whoever in the audience to come up on stage with me. And now the dynamic is small, tiny girl, two giant dudes, they're restraining her. And that that situation being controlled even you know when it kind of goes over the edge and there's back and forth and there's this banter and then there's all these like innuendos and elements but it's all being controlled is a really really vital part of the show for people to be able to see a no matter what happens in the show or in this room she's got it covered and b we're watching her you know she's got control over it she knows what's happening this is her show and they are you know the volunteers are almost props in that scenario which is a really hard thing to achieve when they're twice your size and twice your age. 
And is that your opening effect? Uh, no, it's a it's a middler usually. Okay. Uh, what what do you usually use as an opener? Uh, I got a couple different ones right now. I'm doing an um, an animal gag, like the four legged animal thing, except it has an ending. I basically tell someone name any animal in the room. They name an animal, usually something stupid like a polar bear or whatever. Um, I do the drawing gag and then actually reveal the animal and then it's a through line during the show. But my opening line for the show is, you know, tonight with your help, I want to do the impossible get inside the mind of a man and pause for like 20 seconds and go, you would be perfect. And then use that guy. And it sets this, like the first line that comes out of my mouth is funny and it sets a sardonic tone. And then for the rest of the show, it just, I'm having a conversation playing with the audience. It's never, they're the audience. I'm the performer. They're watching me and there's this bear. It's we're talking and conversing. Like I'm to a point. I love hecklers. Like I love people that are want to interact and get into it because even, you know, it just gives me all that room to play. And people say all the time, you know, the whole concept of people being worried at me, like, I can't believe he interrupted you or he was talking like that, or he said these inappropriate things. And I kind of almost want it sometimes because it allows, you know, without moment, there is no ending. You know, if someone didn't propose me with a situation that I can control, that wouldn't be established in the show. So you have to find that fine line where you can play it. And, you know, where I'm in venues where I can meet the, I always try and meet the audience beforehand because I still get nervous as hell. And I feel like I'm performing for friends if I meet them. So in meeting that, I look for the people that might almost be problems and use them because it kind of gives me material and it gives me room to have fun, you know, not to the point where it takes away from the show or the audience or the enjoyment or the routine, but enough fight where I know they could say something they almost shouldn't and it can be handled. And in that creates a funny moment and a good relationship. And at the end of the day, we're all good and friends. But I find it interesting that you're choosing a mentalism routine as an opener, as opposed to something that very clearly defines your skill because you are at a skill level that most magicians hope to accomplish. And rather than presenting that right at the beginning to establish yourself, you're choosing a mentalism routine uh, as opposed to something with cards or, you know, that, that sort of effect. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of fun because at that point it's, it's unexpected. And for me, sometimes I feel like my show is more comedy with magic as the tool to do so. And there's elements of it that are impressive, but it's really just more about, you know, it's very stand up like sometimes. Um, but in, I have that surprise moment because, because I meet my audience, they never meet me as a performer, you know, unless they're at a show where they bought tickets and they see my face. If it's in a venue where they just come to see a show, they all meet me beforehand and not one person, almost one person ever makes the assumption that I'm the performer. So they all shake my hand and have a conversation meet me before the show. And they see me walk out on stage and immediately they're taken back of a, hey, Oh, we know this girl. We like this girl on the side. Like there's a moment of that. I hear in almost every show where I do it like that, where they applaud and then you hear break. And they realize who I am. And then they cheer again because they're like kind of excited that it's me or that they know because in their brains, you know, you have this image, whether it's an image of a magician or when you're in a venue, you just don't expect someone to talk to you to be the performer. So you have that um, that moment of surprise that's taken from them. And then you that tension, it has to kind of be broken with the comedy line, which is the segue into the animal thing, which takes a minute. And then we get into the skill, I guess. And the comedy itself is definitely a skill and one that you've also presented. And I told you, I would mention when I was most impressed and that was when you were emceeing the panel discussion, because that's a difficult thing to do. A lot of people don't realize until they try it, how difficult it is to emcee well, and just to do comedy alone, but especially improv comedy. Um, so what have you done along the way to prepare you for something like that, that you could present yourself as a confident uh, MC or host in that situation? Yeah, I mean, I've done my best to just try and talk in, in front of an audience as much as possible. I think the element of that that helps me is that I'm confident as a person. And I know if I walked into any room or someone handed me a microphone, I could talk for half an hour and hopefully be entertaining, you know, by interacting with people and feeding off of what they give me. And I think, you know, part of that is just how long I've been on stage for in my life. And then, you know, being okay with sucking, you know, stand up comedy is really freaking hard. It is really 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 hard 
So when I got into the world of doing that, I started, you know, with doing improv and comedy and trying out all these different elements of just being okay at being terrible and walking in front of stage and go, this is going to suck. Like, it's likely not going to go well at all. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have magic as a tool to help me with it. I'm going up there and it's just me and I'm talking. And you have to do, you know, a thousand shows of just being terrible before you kind of create something good, especially with comedy. It's a completely, completely different world from magic. They meet in the middle for some, you know, unique reason. They meet and mesh really well, but they're really, really different things writing a joke is really hard um so part of that i guess is you know flight time experience and the comedy side of things and then the other half would just be i love talking to people and conversing with people and there isn't a situation that i can imagine myself being in where i could be uncomfortable like i love it you know i want to take the weirdness in the moment and talk to anyone and make something out of it i i never i don't have the fear in that well fight club prepares you for that i guess you know they teach you from an early age so what are some of your uh, influences uh, comedy wise as far as uh, comedy writing, uh, establishing, uh, structuring a joke? Do you have yeah, any influences? Have this book, I have, I was reading this Steve Martin book. I got in Nashville, The Born Standing Up. And that was kind of going along the lines. I've really, I'm still pretty damn new to the world of comedy. What's so the Steve, Steve Martin book? It's called Born Standing Up. Oh, nice. Yeah. And it's, it's good. It's, it starts in the 70s and the 80s and it talks about his, you know, life and experience and what it's like, you know, you, to write comedy and be a comedian. Here you go. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah. Professional. Oh, comedy. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And this is a particular act uh, of Steve Martin, actually. Yeah. So this is a, a great book. I mean, I got it for 75 cents. So it's the greatest book in what? the world. <laughs> That's a good investment. Um, <laughs> yeah. 75 cents then, Canadian. 75 cents us i could buy a house oh that. wow that's a yeah that's a huge difference it's a steep price yeah but it, it was it was worth it and when i started getting the world economy i think i went to this stupid thrift bookstore in nashville and came home with a luggage full of just a bunch of random comedy books to just learn as much as i could about it i mean i've learned the most about it through performing and writing i writing jokes doesn't come as easily to me as performing so me reading a book on how to write comedy was kind of tricky of, you know, what the heck do you write about? Whereas when you're on stage, it's just all in the moment. Like you just feed off of what's given to you. And I, you know, much rather be quick, quick ridden than sit behind a computer and come up with things. So let's, uh, two things. I want to talk about what you're doing presently at Hidden Wonders and also what you'll be doing in Tacoma. So uh, mm -hmm. how, what is your involvement? You stay pretty busy with Sean Farquhar's Hidden Wonders. What is it that you're doing there? Yeah, so that's Sean's theater. Um, so whenever I'm home, I work there, which is just kind of behind the stage, helping with the show, with seating and dealing with the guests. So just being in that environment, which I don't talk about enough. I love that show so much because it, I get to listen to a show, almost the same show, a thousand times in a row. Like listening to a performer to that caliber, like listening to Sean perform over the last year has taught me like almost more in elements that I couldn't learn from myself. Because when you're on stage, there's only so much you can hear. But when you hear another performer, you hear where the moments are, where the laughs are, where he comes up with something, how the audience responds to certain things. And that has taught me so much as a performer of like how a half second in something can change it. And I'm, you know, nitpicky beyond belief. And I think sometimes I give a milter feedback that makes him want to shoot me. But it's been, I've learned so much from listening to a show rather than performing a show that I couldn't have got otherwise from that. So whenever I'm home, I spend as much time possible in that space. Okay, so let's nitpick a little bit. Uh, highlights of what specifically, if we get into detail of that you could say that you could pass on to us of what you've learned from that environment. From that, uh, it's, you know, a lot of the times is, giving up things that you love because an audience just doesn't get it or they're not on the same page with it and i get it too there's a lot of you know effects in my love or lines i might love that just seem so excellent but you just don't get the response and eventually you just have to give it up or it's just not working so you have to you know not make everything your baby and be okay with letting it go and there's stuff like that and then being in tune with all the little details like i think one i could give as an example which you know maybe no one else in the world would care about but he has like the intro that plays to the show and then like it's a music transition and then it goes into a welcome to da 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 and there's a joke in that and it wasn't getting a laugh but it's funny and it should and the note that i gave is if in the sound system there's like a half second delay between each track 
because the audience still kind of murmurs a bit and it gives it a moment for them to like settle before the joke because maybe they're not hearing it. And if you add that tiny little bit of time where it fades out and then the next one plays, then maybe they'll hear it. And now we made the change and it gets a laugh every time. But it was just such a, a little detail for that. And I love being able to pay attention and care about something in, enough to notice those things. And I get to do that in my own show now. And I don't know if I would have gotten those tools without being able to listen to it in someone else. Because it's kind of hard to be harsh on your own word. It's kind of hard sure. to sit and watch. I hate watching us. Who doesn't hate watching themselves perform? So it's really hard to watch my work from that perspective of things that need to change. But when it's someone else, I learn those tools and in turn get to take them into my show without having to necessarily watch me a million times, which has been a cool thing. Um, and you'll be bringing a lot of that knowledge to Tacoma. Uh, and what is it that you'll be doing at the IBM convention in Tacoma? Yeah, I, I think I'm emceeing, actually. I think I'm performing oh, nice. a little bit as well, but I, I believe I'm emceeing a show. That's my so, favorite thing. That's my favorite thing. I'm so excited for it, especially in a room full of magicians. I don't want to be doing magic. I just Yeah, right? Funny. People people um, like talk about it's so hard. Now, oh, I can't believe like that's that's and it is. There's a lot of skill involved, but would yeah. you rather not have to do magic in front of magicians. It, oh yeah, yeah. Totally this is agree. it's the best yeah. gig. And I told Ben as soon as I got, I'm like, you give me the, uh, you give me the list now. I'm gonna start writing now. Yeah, uh, you know, because that's gonna be a fun show. I feel it's like cha I it's challenging and fun at the same time. Kind of gives you a comfort level that other people don't get to experience because they're backstage nervous the whole time of like, are the magicians gonna like this trick? You know? Yeah. Yeah, and you get to be that breather, and it's fun, and you can say things and get away with them. It's gonna be a fun show. Right on. Uh, and I encourage everybody to, we had such a fabulous time at the last convention where you emceed an amazing panel discussion um, with couples and magic. Uh, and we saw some incredible performers. Um, that camaraderie and the community that gets together is just unlike anything you could possibly experience. So anybody who hasn't registered yet, uh, please register for the convention in Tacoma. It's going to be incredible. Um, what else do you have planned as far as your goal? I mean, you've achieved so much already, like things that magicians that have been around for years and years and years would hope to accomplish, like the Magic Castle, like performing at the Chicago Magic Lounge. So what is in your future? What, what, what sites do you have set? Yeah, I mean, my goals right now are split a little bit down the middle because I love live performance more than anything in the world. And I always want to be doing that. But on the other side of things, I'm trying to build this you know, almost legacy for myself within not just the world of magic, but within the world. And a lot of that is going to be done digitally, you know, through a through this TV show that I'm working on and then be all these other elements. So my live goal right now is working towards doing the illusionist or a touring show. And, you know, we're doing Masters of Illusion or whatever. So I get that being on the road experience in audiences of that size. Um, and I want to do Broadway hopefully by the end of this year or next. And then oh, wow. with the digital world, it's, you know, building my own TV show and coming up with publicity stunts and, you know, getting to that Houdini level, so to speak, in the world. And one way that you've been very involved with the IBM is social media and uh, mm -hmm. being of a generation that understands it and uh, knows how to, first of all, create a post and, and how to do things that most guys are like clueless about. Um, what can you tell us about the importance of that in this day and age? If you are a, a, a professional in the industry of how important is it to be involved in social media and what advice would you give? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard. It's not really enjoyable because it's tedious. Like, I don't think anyone that really does social media loves doing it because there's just so much pressure and the stuff that you put the most effort into doesn't do well. The stuff that you put no effort into does well. It's just how it works and it's frustrating and no one really understands the algorithm. But at the end of the day, that is almost your resume. That is your portfolio. When someone hears about you in this day and age, the first thing they do is look you up and what they see is your brand. That is who they're booking. It doesn't necessarily mean the more followers you have, the more gigs you're going to get. It just means that when it comes down to, you know, picking a person for something if they can see a brand that they love an image that they love and you look at like you're a whole human being and they're not just snapshots it's a useful tool to have um and the greatest thing about it is that you can reach an audience a hundred times the size of anyone else in the world because you have a digital community where you can post things and reach people all over the world you know there's only so many people you can fit into a theater but if you want a fan base all over the world you know, it's a great way of doing that and transitioning from, you know, social media to TV is a different direction. But for me, 
my biggest goal in life or something that's really important to me is when people buy tickets to my show, I want people to come to see me. I don't want to be just another Vegas act where people buy tickets to see a magic show and I'm the person that happens to be doing it. I want people when they walk into a room to know who I am because I think, you know, my, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but I think, and I've seen it, that if people walk into a show not knowing who you are, they're almost not going to remember you when they walk out because they just don't care. They've been entertained and they leave. But if you kind of establish that element where people care, where they want to come and see you and they do, and they buy a ticket and they see your show and it just extends that you know element of them that's a fan and then they leave and then you have this kind of cool relationship where you're more of a public figure than just a magician. You're more than just the person doing a job. And social media is a great tool to get you towards going to that direction. If any of that makes sense. No, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, when you think about... Uh, what Bill Malone would do the trick to get people to remember his name because how many people have we run into that they say, Oh, I saw this amazing magician on this cruise ship. What was his name? Uh, they have no idea. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can the yeah, greatest no of your life. If they don't know who you are, they don't know who you are. Yeah. And then cases like me where people know you as a name that then gets taken over by a male stripper who makes a movie, then you have that to compete with. But anyway, so, so you're saying <laughs> you're not the stripper? I'm not that magic Mike. It's a different, different guy. I know it, it, people confuse us all the time. I think he's a little taller, maybe, maybe, maybe less pepper uh, in the hair, less pepper. Um, or I don't know if he dyes his hair, but, uh, for those that don't know the reference, it's an actor. I believe his name is, uh, chanting scrotum. Uh, and he made a movie, stole my name, <laughs> long story. <laughs> and he doesn't so, even do card tricks. That's the crazy thing. That was so I was I was so disappointed. Spoiler alert, no card tricks in that movie. I do need to watch the other two because there's now a second and a third movie, and I can't make fun of them if I don't watch them, obviously. So I've got Have a, you seen the I live show? A, no, I haven't seen the live show. Where would what in Vegas? in Vegas? Like Yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, tell me about all right. Let's we're gonna take a I break from so the magic. Surprised. I want to hear about the live show of the Magic Mike show in Vegas. Tell me about it. It felt almost illegal. Like it, well, you know, not I think so much, it was but illegal. it was just, I was Probably because really you weren't supposed to be there. It was illegal because you were there is what it is. I mean, maybe a little bit. I mean, the, the 18 plus thing seems a little bit, but you know, America. You mean but, illegal like Canadian Fight Club illegal or because they were doing like, listen, or like raunchy? Listen, two, two subcategories. But, you know, every girl in that room, you know, unless obviously they give you safe, I think the safe word for that is unicorn or whatever, and they won't touch you. But if you don't, every girl in that room gets touched. Like these guys will come oh, really? up in the audience and like pick you up out of your seat and run their hands through your hair and you'll put wow. your hands on their chest. It's like you will have this really sexually intimate moment with this random actor during a show and then they move on to the next girl. Every girl in that room gets touched unless, you know, you say unicorn. But I was like, Wait, hold on. Oh. Okay, unicorn. Had, we're getting into a whole another level here, but that's that's the safe word because that's also means a different. That's a different word, like unicorn, yeah, you know? upside down but pineapple. Those are words that that shouldn't be considered safe words because they have other meanings. Like yeah, well, well, emotes. it's because the host of the show, you know, arrives on a unicorn or whatever. But anyways, the oh. host is is a chick. It's a badass chick. She's dressed like powerfully. She's got this like blazer with some bedazzles and these tight black jeans, you know, and these boots, not dressed sexually. And she's a comedian and she's an effing powerhouse. Like she okay. hosts the entire show and makes it like sexual and interesting, but like she's in charge. And that's the element of it that I like, I, I watch it from a performance perspective. Like, oh, I love the role of the girl and she speaks really well and she's entertaining and, you know, she owns the show and I love that. I'm like all the other dudes, it was, it was weird. Uh, you know, a, a little strange, but the girl was badass. I like that. And so, did how did you feel? Were you were you touched by the stage performers? Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe in passing. In pass, in pa just a, a a fleeting moment of like flicking the hair kind of thing. <laughs> it um, wasn't a long term relationship, Michael, but we got to know each other. Okay, so that it's a very interesting show and what, what percentage of the crowd would you say is female as opposed to male all pretty much all i mean it's okay. vegas so they're all like bachelorette parties whatever there was that makes sense the, you know the weirdest thing about that is so there was a girl a guy sitting next to me with his girlfriend and halfway through the show he tried to kiss me like halfway through the show he turned over to me and grabbed my face and tried to kiss me and I was like almost thinking that, you know, because of the environment that the show sets where it's like when you're a sexy guy, you kind of get away. Like you just have like all the girls are there 
to you know be touched and interact with guys that he wow. was just like oh this is a thing that can happen i was like dude what the f-? so that was the only yeah. like actual uncomfortable moment in the entire show was some you know dude with his girlfriend just being macho man in it but i'm, I'm glad you're describing this because now i while I still gonna, I feel like I should watch the other two movies so I can mm-hmm. uh, properly make fun of them. I now don't feel that I need to go to watch the Vegas Magic Mike show because you've described yeah. it so thoroughly. Um, nor do I think that I need to be there in the crowd. Um, because it was so really- weird. It was so weird. I mean, it's the same. I thought that we need to get too much of this. <laughs> now we're just talking about stripping and strip shows, but it's like almost the same kind of thing where it's like, I, I, I don't know if you feel this way, but like you can go to a strip club and there's, you know, as sexy as appealing as it could be, there's almost an element where you kind of feel a little bit like off about the whole environment, you know? And maybe Michael's like, this, what do you mean? I go every Tuesday night, it's great. We don't need to get into this. But I had the same feeling from that as I did from the show. Final stop, let's stop talking about strippers. So essentially to wrap it up, it's basically like a, a strip a strip club in a grand theater is what yes. we're looking at. Okay. Um, which is, it, I guess, what yeah. you would expect, which you, which, which you should expect f- from that oh, show. Yes. But the point of all of this is that there are no card tricks. There are, there are no card alert. tricks. Spoiler alert. No card tricks in the Magic the true Mike show. Magic Mike. I'm the OG Magic Mike. I'm you the original. Are the one. Hashtag not that Magic Mike, uh, which is the name of my my Twitch channel, so people can understand the difference. So um, uh, now that we cut out my ten minute conversation about male strippers. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I'm going to see what I, I think. No, we're, you kept it clean. You kept it clean enough. I think yeah. we're okay. Uh, <laughs> But uh, that I, I don't know exactly how that segues in to the 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 next point I was going to bring up uh, because I'm sure everyone's wondering why I haven't up until this point, and uh, that is your hat. So uh, I will tell you this: that had you not worn it, I wasn't even going to talk about the 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 challenges of being a female magician or how you know our industry is so male dominated because i figure you're sick of hearing it uh everybody's hearing about it we're constantly hearing about how we should be equal but yet we're finding ways to still uh, focus on how we're not um Mm -hmm. i was going to focus more on the fact that your challenges are the fact that you're so young and that you have to prove yourself because you're a young magician that people may not think you know is is worthy or is of Mm -hmm. of the skill level that she needs to be but you showed up with your amazing hat that i believe is you started that your campaign um so Mm -hmm. uh you you have the floor so please talk about your your male magician hat yeah i mean i grew up in the world of magic and from a very very early age if it wasn't for magicians if it actually wasn't for magicians i think it would have taken a long time for me to notice that there was a hole in the demographic it was only because at every convention I ever went to is, oh, who's your dad? Who brought you here? Where's your boyfriend? Like, do you, do you know anything about magic? Like that kind of thing. And then once or, you are, are you an actually, assistant, right? Or, or who's yes, assistant? Or are, are you, exactly. uh, how many pieces do you get cut into? It, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then eventually when you're, you're more established to a sense where people just know that you're a magician, it ends up being, oh, she's a great female magician or you're, you're a female magician or, you know, like you're just a woman in magic and that is it, final stop. And you know, there reached a point where it didn't take very long after about five minutes where I went, if you were to say male magician, it would sound beyond stupid. Um, and a couple of years later, I think I was at a convention. I'm like, guys, I'm just gonna get a shirt or a hat that says male magician and like have you guys wear it or walk around with it. And just like, it's almost a joke as in if people go, oh, that sounds stupid. You wouldn't say that to almost, you know, take away from the other element. Sure. Which is exactly what happened when I created it. There were hundreds of people that went, same male magician sounds so stupid like why are you trying to create some you know sexism you know merchandise whatever it was but people were butthurt about it and i'm like but that is the entire point they were upset because they're saying you know male magician is just dumb you shouldn't say it i'm like you've been calling us female magicians you know since the witch era yes it's the (laughs) so yeah if your hat said female magician then we should burn you at the stake basically 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 but it does um, make so- but it, it does make sense to you now my my next guest on the show is harrison greenbaum i don't know if he qualifies mm-hmm. as a male magician or, or what or how he identifies all um, inclusive but uh, the who i was trying to get who is going to be a future guest on my show um ai generated an exact opposite to gabriella lester which was mark de 
So I was trying to have two polar opposites. I'm not sure why, but the what's considered to be the exact opposite of Gabriella Lester is Mark D'Souza, who's going to be a future guest sense. on something up my sleeve. Um, yeah. But I think he would qualify as a male magician. I think so. Uh, so I think, I think so. we need to send him a hat. We need to send him a hat. Yeah, or send him a link. Send the link so he can buy a hat. Yeah. Okay. Keeps the lights on, Michael. I don't have a. I need a hat. I don't have a hat yet. But you can't hide the hair. No, I don't want to hide the hair. But also, um, because Adora. I've done so many impressions, um, I don't think I even qualify as a male magician. I could be. I could, you know, I can be incognito, and yeah, uh, just... I could be basically. I could be any type of magician you want. Just be Sean Farquhar. I could be, I could be, yeah. I, well, I do need a hat that says Sean Faquar. That would be great. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't have that hat yet. Um, and I don't, I don't resemble him as much as when I was able to, I used, we had the same color hair at one point. I was able to spike it up. Mm -hmm. So I looked more like him and that was before I even wore glasses. So when I put the glasses on, you know, it was, it was more like now I'm, I'm in character. Well, now, unfortunately I need these to be able to see the computer screen. Uh, so He's I have live to live in character. I have to find other ways of portraying the character. Uh, so maybe it, maybe the hat would would kind of specify who I am. Uh, but I, I think the voice does it basically. Uh, it, as long as I break into that voice, people know. Be like, this is my hat. I'm Sean Fakework. I have a hat on. Yeah. I'm Canadian. Yeah. So good. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea why I'm able to emulate him. but uh, uh, And he's been not only my mentor, one of your mentors as well. Um, which is, it's, uh, I think it's so cool. I think many people in the world would be so envious to know that you're able to learn from thousands of shows at Hidden Wonders. Uh, it's, that's an amazing situation to be in. Um, so that was, a, that was a great take, and I'm glad we were able to cover that subject matter. Um, before we go, uh, anything, and I'm going to keep you around for a little bit after, but anything, uh, anything that you wanted to promote, talk about um, that we haven't yet, that we could discuss uh, before we say goodbye. No, no, I'm doing my thing. Keep following me online, check out my stuff, and say hello. And you'll send me all the links that we're going to post in chat and everything like that. I got you. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. We want to make sure to promote you. And uh, if you have anything you want to promote about the IBM, Gabriella is the one that is handling up the social media. So make sure that you're tagging IBM, you're tagging her so that she can properly promote it. And uh, we hope to see you in Tacoma where Gabby will be doing her thing as well. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, it has been Thanks an absolute treat to have you. Um, and uh, best of luck in the continuation of your career because we can't see, we can't wait to see where you're going to take this. Um, you are an amazing magician and an amazing performer and uh, you have our utmost respect. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you. The stage is yours, Harrison. Thank you. Yeah, so I decided to be a comedian senior year of college. That's when I had to tell my parents who were paying for college. <laughs> like I had to sit them down. I was like, mom, dad, I have something very difficult to tell you. And they were like, you're gay. <laughs> I was like, no, I want to be a comedian. <laughs> and they were like, we'd rather you be gay. Like, is that? Is that still an option on the table? Because we'll go to the parade. We will go. <laughs> I get it. People think I'm gay because uh, every single thing about me. <laughs> it's weird when you're not gay, but people think you're gay. People will argue with you about you, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> right? <laughs> Same boat. <laughs> right? <laughs> They don't do that with their other preferences. I've never been at a deli. They're just like, hey, do you want cucumber? I'm like, nah. They're like, mm, you want cucumber? <laughs> you look and sound like you love cucumber. <laughs> no, I don't. We're going to put it on your sandwich. You're lying to yourself. <laughs> All right, that's it for me. Thank you so much, no, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. I am so excited to have our next guest as part of the show because he's really the reason this show exists. During the pandemic, he decided it would be a good idea to interview magicians from all over the world on a show called Who Books That, which you can still see at whobookstat.com and see some of the past interviews with amazing magicians. And then 
Well, fortunately for me to be able to do this, but unfortunately for all of us, he got so busy with his career that he was no longer doing that show. And now we have this show, Something Up My Sleeve, and I'm so happy to have him here and to talk to him. And if you're following the Magic community at all, then you already are in love with him. David Copperfield recently said he's the funniest magician that he's ever seen, and he is the first magician ever to headline a Cirque du Soleil show. Welcome to Something Up My Sleeve. Harrison Greenbaum. Hello. Did you hit record this time? Did I you, hit we're record. Recording? We're yes. recording. Oh, oh, wait. We're supposed to pretend we, we didn't just record half the episode. For us. Nobody has a clue, except now oh, I've got this great the best one, room. though. We're never going to beat it. We're, this, this is all a charade in which we attempt to recapture the magic. That you, was were, the you were so on. Did. You were so on, and then I like I didn't want to stop you, but then I'm realizing, well, I'm the only one that gets to enjoy this. I better say, and hold I said, on a no, second. No, stop the recording. We're starting from the top. I want you to wear two microphones on your face. That's what I said. I said, you Both. only had one microphone. I need you to have two microphones, or this is not going to happen. This is, this is my sportscaster look. Do you like that? I mean, and, it, yeah, there's a lot going on there. I've seen I've seen videos on the internet where that's like that, but exactly I don't allowed to google them most of the people that have interviewed you look like this so that's i wanted to try to duplicate that because oh, okay. uh yeah i saw a lot of like disc jockeys asking you mm. about stuff and and uh they i don't know for whatever reason they had this going on but y- you've got a cleaner look <laughs> well you know what the radio any of the radio interviews are always at like six o'clock in the morning so you've already yeah. had the beat there this was yeah. a reasonable hour <laughs> it was a reasonable hour and uh, we had a nice rehearsal just now yeah, exactly. Yeah, so and I, I thank you for mentioning who books that. That was a joy to do during the pandemic. It basically came from the idea of, hey, a lot of people have a lot less to do than they normally do. So maybe they'll talk to me. And we put together, you know, a murderer's row of magicians. Um, uh, amazing Jonathan, Matt King, Penn Gillette, Um, Just an incredible list. All at whobookstat.com. All the old episodes are still there. Uh, it was so exciting to work with the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Um, I actually put my little presidential citation right over here. There it is. Nice. Everything's reversed on the screen. So I have to really do a Vanna White thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it was a really, really fun thing to do. And I really think we brought a lot of magicians together with it. And uh, so yeah, uh, definitely check all those old episodes out. They're in video and podcast form at whobooksthat.com. And uh, yeah, and I still have the same lights. You'll recognize the lights <laughs> still in the back. A different well, apartment though. A lot has changed since 2020. You've had a lot going on. You've had some in- incredible uh, accolades going on in your career. Before we get into that, though, I did want to mention that everyone should go back and watch your previous interviews because you've captured some things that I will never be able to capture on something up my sleeve because we have some magicians who have since passed on <laughs> that you were able to interview. Um, like Mac set that up, it, got, it got real tragic real fast. They're like, <laughs> you got some people I'll never get. Um, yeah. They're dead. They're dead now. And I tried to get them on the show, but they're dead. But then I mentioned Matt King, who's not dead, actually. Not um, dead. Yeah. He's, he's a <laughs> national treasure, that man. He is national not treasure. dead. Uh, no, it, it, is, it is crazy to think that some of them have passed away since we did them. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, 2020 right. through 2021. So a couple of years ago. Um, I'm glad I got to capture... Um, what I did, I mean, I really worked people through their whole life stories. There's lots of multimedia. There were surprise guests. So the idea was doing all this crazy research. I think one of the craziest was Matt Franco's grandmother, who I tracked down and kind of had to teach her how to use the iPad in order to get her on the show. So Matt was shocked, not only that I found his grandmother, because I used his brother to do that, um, but that I that I got her to use technology <laughs> to get on the show. She was a total delight. Um, so like all that kind of stuff. I found Mark Summers's like his, the teacher that when he was in like, I think he was in elementary school that got him into magic. And I tracked him down through basically a private detective app and found this guy. Um, so it's all about trying to find really cool surprise guests and, and illuminate their stories. Um, I think Harry Lorraine, um, who has since passed, he's the longest episode because he had, we had to cover over 90 years of magic history with wow. him. I mean, George Schindler is a surprise guest. That's another 90 plus years of magic history. So we were joking that there was over 200 magic years on that, you know, at one time on screen. Um, We had the whole left-handed league come together. Um, That was really cool. So we just, it was just a really fun thing to do during the pandemic. I think people really enjoyed it and we did it live and people were getting their questions in and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was, uh, yeah, still still up there. Still check them out. And 
Uh, we're going to go completely out of order now because yeah, we, do we it. Did a, we did it perfect during the rehearsal. We're crazy, uh, but I I know how challenging it is just to do it once a month to try to have two guests on the show. And as you know, because uh, I was able to get a hold of you last minute, which <laughs> I I I have so wanted to have you on the show, and I was like, we're gonna we're gonna save it for an anniversary episode or something really cool. Which actually it is because I've now done two full years. So two Ooh. seasons. Yeah. And so you're starting off the new year. So this is right. this the, the, the first one of, of, of 2024. Um, but you were actually, you had one a, a week going. Uh, you had I a guest. Each. We did two a week. And I almost two a week because it was insane. Because <laughs> it's I, I would put together these PowerPoints and I'm self-producing it. So as I'm talking to them, I'm pulling up social, you know, the media stuff, video, photo. So all the research, finding the special surprise guests. Um, and then we scaled it back a little bit to once a week, um, which felt a lot more manageable. Um, are those swords behind you? Uh, yes, the, those are those are swords. Um, I have a, a martial arts background, which has nothing to do with that, because, you know, karate means empty hand, uh, which means I'm not supposed to hold those. Um, but I just thought they look cool. Yeah, I yeah. just thought like, you know, so it's like you have some magic stuff and uh, swords. Yeah. If you put the small one on top of the big one, it turns into a bigger sword. Oh, right. Yeah. Just like the <laughs> rainbow illusion. That's perfect. Yeah. Only a magician would see that. That's, <laughs> exactly. that's how we know you're not just a comedian. There you go. <laughs> so was there a time during that project that within all the work that went into it that you knew there's no way once the pandemic is done, I'll be able to continue at this pace with what you were putting into that? I mean, just just booking guests is it was difficult enough. Yeah, I mean, it was taking up a considerable portion of my week. I was booking the guests. I was doing all the research, which took forever, uh, putting together all the media stuff, and then getting the surprise guests, which sometimes, as it as I mentioned, required private detective software finding some <laughs> guy, I think, in Michigan, and then hoping he wasn't creeped out when I found his phone number and just called him out of the blue, like, hey, you don't know who I am, but I, 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 I have this thing with Mark Summers. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really, really or, fun. I or calling someone's grandmother. Which actually the uh, just, you know, side note, the only way to get in touch with Shin Lim is through his mom. So, um, yeah, manager, right. Yeah, I've been I, I, I email back and forth uh, with his mom, who, by the way, uh, she has a nickname. The America's Got Talent people call her Dragon Lady. Oh, no, I don't know if that's good. <laughs> I don't I, know if it's good or not. Very, but it's... She's a very nice lady and uh, does 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 a lot for her, her baby boy. <laughs> Her baby boy, yeah. Um, so can I get back up to my what's normally my first question, which yes. is what is something up your sleeve? Um, and you have Nothing short baby, sleeves. I got short <laughs> sleeves. Trick question. Yes, but uh on a different level, meaning what what do you bring to the table? What is it that makes you you that separates you from other performers? It feels like a first date. Um, I'm a generous lover. Uh <laughs> Uh, no, I, you know, I no, I'm going to say, I'm going to say again that that was my final, that was going to be my final question is that um, just, uh, just out of the blue, if I were to come out of the closet, would you date me? I'm, I'm married. My, my, my but, wife will be married. married yeah, with me. <laughs> you can't, you can't. That's okay. That's an, that's an acceptable response. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, it's, it's taken me a really long time to try to figure it out. Um, Cause I, 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 I do stand up straight stand up or straight as I can do it. And uh, I toured the country just headlining doing comedy without magic. Uh, and then I have my, my comedy plus magic show, which is stand-up comedy and magic combined. It's my baby. I love doing it. Um, and so I guess the, the short version of summing it up is like, there are a lot of magicians who do comedy. Uh, and I'm more of a comedian who does magic. And so that's sort of the best I've come up with to just sort of describe the, the, the difference where it's, it's very comedy focused. I want you to walk away feeling like you, you saw a really great stand-up kind of performance, but also there was all this really cool magic too. And so that's the feeling that I want you, you to get when you, when you walk out of my show. And people have said before that that is a much more marketable thing. If you say comedian, it's marketable. People understand it. Magician, people don't quite understand and not as easy to market. But my question is. But that, that, you... then, it, then it gets into a little bit of like my uh, pet peeve, which is if you, I can the term comedian. I worked really hard to have that sort of word, and all my my colleagues who are comedians. There's a lot of magicians who are not comedians who call themselves comedians. If you're doing just comedy magic, and the only way you can do it is with all the magic, 
And to put it further, and if, if most of the jokes you're doing are not yours, um, and you like you just bought a bunch of comedy magic tricks, you're not you're not a comedian. Um, in my in, by my definitions, um, I the you are all terrible book. We we go over all of this stuff. It's it's a big part of my lecture because um, a lot of it came from being a comedian, hanging out with a lot of comedians, seeing their process. How do they create stuff? And I was like, wait, they're doing it completely backwards from the way magicians do it. Um, and so that that's where a lot of that came out of. And it was like, hey, no, comedians, they come up with the idea, then they figure out how to make it funny. Then, you know, that's where these unique original things come out of. Uh, and so we talk about, you know, a lot of magic being cover bands where they're doing somebody else's trick with somebody else's script based on a performance they saw somebody else do. And it doesn't, it's not to undermine the value of being a cover band. Like some of my best friends are cover bands, but, uh, <laughs> um, but like, it, there, there's a difference. There should be a distinction. Um, but like, yeah, the, the, the problem with magic is if you're a Beatles cover band, but then you walk around like I'm John Lennon. Because <laughs> right. sometimes the audience doesn't know. They don't know that you're doing the Beatles. They, they, they yeah. do think you are John Lennon, so you, you don't correct them. Um, so I think that's that, that's that sort of distinction in there. You know, my term I call it a paint by numbers act. Yeah, yeah. When you absolutely. when you just duplicate the pattern that came with the trick. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, now, have you been in a situation as you've created more fame? Have you been in a situation where you're doing your book to do comedy? You're doing straight comedy, and somebody's like, "Do a trick, magic boy." You know what? Th that that's never happened. But you also haven't been in my audience recently, so maybe next time you're in there, maybe you're the one who's screaming. <laughs> I don't think you've ever said "magic boy." They usually use slurs that we can't repeat. Right. Um, they. <laughs> That would be honestly, that would be a gentle heckle. If that's all I heard, I would right. be thrilled. <laughs> um, no, I, I uh, the serious answer is I, I try to do a pretty good job of advertising. If you come to see me at like a magic theater, like if I'm at the Magic Castle or the Chicago Magic Lounge, or I'm at wherever wherever I'm at, Smoke and Mirrors, I'm gonna be there in February. Um, oh, nice. Uh, but like th 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 those places that you're gonna see me do magic. Um, if I'm at a comedy club and it's there's nothing else. It, it just says stand-up comedy. Probably just going to do comedy. And the expectation when they come in, like a lot of the credits, like Last Comic Standing and um, Conan and stuff, were just straight stand-up. So there, I, I, I've done a good job of sort of navigating this sort of dual life of comedian magician. Um, I haven't run into that yet, but uh, there's still time. It very much it, that very much could happen. <laughs> Well, and, and it's hard to go back, right? So like once you start doing magic, the, and you said earlier, I say that to the end because how do you how do you go back to like, oh, now I just want to tell you some jokes and forget about the card trick. Uh, so so it's hard. It's, it's, it's difficult structure. Yeah, I mean, my well, that's why in stand-up, it's just stand-up. Um, and if, you, and if, if you're going to put a trick in that, you do it at the end. Um, and then you get out. Uh, put on your little parachute, jump out, I'm out. Um, but with, uh, my, my comedy and magic show, uh, like what just happened, which I've been touring all over the world now for a long time. Um, there is a rhythm of comedy into magic, into comedy, into magic. And it has a nice, it has a nice structure. Um, and so I think that, that, that kind of ride sets them up rhythmically for like, there's going to be some stand up, then the magic trick connected to that stand up. Then there's going to be stand up, then the magic trick connected to that stand up, and it, it alternates. Um, so I think their expectations are sort of, they understand where this ride, how this ride works. Um, and hopefully the comedy is strong enough that they, they, they enjoy it. And then the magic is strong. Like at, at either point, they're not going, Oh God, I want the other one. Hopefully they're enjoying both equally. So I, I love for this to be not only entertaining for everyone who would love to to hear from you, but also educational. So let's talk a little bit about how you structure a joke or a routine. Um, any tidbits you can give us on what goes into that or an example of something that took a long time to really work out. Yeah. Um, it's all in this book. You are all terrible. Now, but nice. Yeah. Not, no. <laughs> uh, happy to go over it. Um, the, the very simple building blocks of a joke um, is you have the premise or setup, which is tension. You're built, you're blowing up the balloon. And then there's the punchline which is what pops or releases that tension, right? There's boom, there's that rush. Um, and then there are tags, which are additional punchlines that don't require a new setup. You use the old setup. Um, so it's a way to squeeze more laughs per minute 
uh, out of your set because instead of if if a premise takes thirty seconds, which would be a long premise, um, that might be a long time to go without a laugh. But and then your punchline takes ten seconds. That forty second unit means you have one laugh for forty seconds. But if in the next ten seconds you do another tag, so that, that additional punchline, and then another ten seconds, another tag. Now in that 60 second unit, if I did my math correctly, you have three laughs. So that's uh, a laugh every 20 seconds. So you just doubled your laugh per minute. Um, and then you have callbacks, which are essentially tags, um, but out of time. They're, they're, they're tags to jokes that have already happened in the past. But the related callbacks and tags are related in that they don't require new premises. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the basic structure of a joke. Um, so when you're coming up with a joke, in general, you come up with the premise first. Um, I want to talk about X. Um, premises are are very valuable to me. Um, I walk around with a notebook and when something strikes me, I write it down. Ooh, maybe this is a good thing for a joke. Uh, and then that's when the real work begins. So you have the premise, the idea, and then you're figuring out what is that twist? What is that surprise? Surprise is a, is a big thing. Um, figuring out how to release that laugh and then how do you keep generating additional laughs. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, yeah, that's the general joke structure. And then once you have the joke written, um, I talk about the three C's of comedy a lot, Com uh, contrast, compression, and clarity. And those are sort of the questions you ask yourself when the joke isn't working, when that premise punchline is not releasing the laugh that you're expecting. Those are the three sort of areas that you need to be looking at the joke to see where is it failing in one of those areas because it's failing in at least one of those areas. That's why it's not getting a laugh. So then I get in there and I can fine tune it. So contrast, these all, these are all like, we can go, we could literally talk for hours about this. Sure. I'm yeah. It's very like airplane view down. Um, but contrast is sort of the, the conflict between two forces in a joke. There's lots of intricacies with what that means. Um, there's clarity. How clear are you? I mean, getting that message across directly, succinctly, and in a way that makes sense. Um, and then you have a compression, which is so important. We're talking about last per minute already. We're trying to squeeze it down as small as possible. Um, there is a point sometimes where I squeeze a joke so far, it breaks. It loses either that clarity um, or contrast. Um, so there is, there is a breaking point. But the idea is, to, I, I often like to edit it so much that I, it breaks, and then I go one step back. So now I know that's the shortest that joke can be. Um, it can be a little bit of a weird process because you have five minutes of material that you love and over time you keep compressing it. So all of a sudden you always end up with the same amount of time because that joke keeps shrinking. You add a new joke, that joke keeps shrinking and you get this very, it's like, you know, forming juice into concentrate. You end up with this very potent um, sort of dense uh, collection of jokes. You want them, I mean, that, that, compression and brevity is really, really important in comedy. And I think in magic, magic, you know, I talk in the book about multiple phases. If the multiple phase is not adding anything significant, creating surprise or any kind of contrast, you might not need all of those phases. You know, how many times can you link a ring and unlink it? The audience is like, we get it. We, we get it. They're, okay. They're like, why are you holding these giant hoops? Who owns these metal rings? This is weird. That is That's so... It is so weird because you just segued perfectly into the next thing I was about to bring hey. up, which is the first time I saw you. Uh, mm -hmm. The very first time I met you and saw you was at the uh, uh, Monday Night Magic in New York. Ah, uh, yes. And I was, I've been wondering for the longest time if this was a joke you use regularly or if it was a, just a throwaway um, and how much improv comes into your routine. Because, and I stole this joke from you, but I credited to you immediately and I changed it from French to Spanish. You'll understand what I mean in a moment. Okay. But I was, I, I went to see you with my sister. It was the first time I saw you. You became instantly one of my heroes. And I was like useless for the next 30 minutes because of this one joke. Boris Wilde had just finished his linking ring routine, which was absolutely beautiful. He used this Madonna song nobody's heard of. And you then came on stage and said, did you see that? He linked the rings, then he unlinked them. Then he did it like 17 more times because wild in French means repetitive. Oh, there you go. <laughs> nice. Do you remember? 
total improv. Well, I then used it when I was introducing Oscar Munoz and said Munoz in Spanish means repetitive. Okay, I stole that from Harrison Greenbaum. Uh, but I <laughs> well, you say that part of the joke every time, then yeah. I'm okay. <laughs> I did. I did. And now, you know, well, and uh, in, in the same scenario, I don't have that many opportunities to use that joke because it's only when you're following a linking ring act. Right. And that's why I realized that you may have just thrown that in there when you were watching him from side stage. Because you don't have that many opportunities to follow a linking ring act and do that joke. But that, as a magician in the crowd, had me just useless. I don't even remember. There were some great magicians on that show. Don't even <laughs> remember. Because my sister was like, will you calm down? Because I couldn't stop laughing when you said that. Um, and it was just so great. Wild in French means repetitive. And, <laughs> and I mean, I love, I love those kind of jokes. I mean, I think at Monday Night Magic once, I was hosting and they gave an award to, I think it was like an 80-year-old. And I remember coming up, give it up to, what's his name? The future of magic. <laughs> and it's just like those good lines delight me uh, to no end. Absolutely. Um, and well, so uh, on that particular uh, notion of uh, having, you know, met you in that scenario, um, I, I was wondering what, is it about magic that makes some routines okay to do over and over when we say the first rule is never do the same trick twice unless you're linking rings together and apart or, or doing ambitious parasols. Cards. There can never be enough parasols. What? <laughs> Everyone knows parasols break down, right? We all know that you open an umbrella, but then it closes really small. Yeah. We, everybody knows how that works. There's no lay person who's like, Man, how did that big umbrella get really small for a second? I, where could it possibly have been? They, they they always come open and giant. I've never seen a tiny closed umbrella. Uh, <laughs> let's call them a parasol. Maybe they won't figure it out. Um, the it's the book talks about it a little bit because we talk yeah. about contrast um, because there's not that much contrast if you're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and compression too, like we're trying to keep things short. So why are we repeating the same thing over and over again? So my inclination in general is to reduce the amount of phases. Um, doesn't mean you a uh, trick can't have more than one phase. Um, I think the key is, is the next phase adding something significantly different? Um, and so it is worth the audience and your time to keep going. In an ambitious card, when the card comes to the top, that's cool. And then when all of a sudden it's bent and now there's like this extra layer, I think you can maybe justify that for as an example or something vanishes, but now it's a sign thing. Um, uh, there's there's ways of doing, you know, there, there are multi-phase tricks where the thing builds. Um, so I, there there are exceptions to that. But you, you, it's it's a lot about just asking yourself that question. Do I need to link and unlink as many times as I am? Or am I just doing it because the song is four minutes? <laughs> Yeah. Maybe five or three okay. minutes on. Right. A uh, great, great follow up. The great follow up to that routine. And I'm, I'm kind of happy that you didn't even remember that because that was such a, a brilliant moment of comedy. Um, which, which, by the way, I me... think we were talking about where we saw each other. Yes. I have a weird memory, and you probably can fill in all the details. Uh, but uh, I feel like you were trying to do some kind of magic castle thing in New Orleans. You asked me to audition, I couldn't fly to New Orleans. And this was like 2017, 18, maybe in that world, maybe even earlier. And you said, don't worry. Uh, do you have Skype? And I Skyped in. I was standing in front of my laptop. I Skyped in and you had me on a screen in New Orleans and your laptop was facing the audience. So I was virtually performing for that audience in New Orleans for some audition. And I feel like that was like basically the first Zoom show years before the pandemic. And I remember doing it and going, wow. This is the future. I didn't even have to leave my apartment. Man, I wish I could do this more. And that was a monkey's paw situation. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, but this was years ago, years before the pandemic. Yeah, everything about what you said makes sense, except that I don't see why I would need to have you audition because if I had seen you, I would already know that I wanted you there uh, unless well, I, I just wanted that. you to meet the other people or uh, perform in front of them. But yeah, we had... Uh, for a while, and I, and I'm looking for a venue to get this going again. But we had a haunted house called the Mysterious Mansion, and that's, that's what it was called. Yes, 
and we we actually did it. We did a soft opening where so there was three. It was basically like a smaller version of the Magic Castle. We had three different rooms: a uh, stage show, a parlor show, close up room with st- stadium seating. There was a magic mirror you'd come through. Um, we did it. We did a soft opening with about two hundred people that showed up. Uh, and the, the problem was the reason it doesn't exist now is. Um, the city never gave them their liquor license. They could oh, not get no. the liquor license. And, you know, as you know, if you're going to have several performers there, uh, entertainment, and you have a ticketed event where you, you don't have the, it's not like a haunted house where they're just there 15 minutes and you could have a line out of the door forever. Uh, there was no way to be able to pay everybody in profit unless you have a liquor license. Um, but, uh, you know, in New Orleans, it's, everything's corrupt. Uh, so, <laughs> which, you know, when I do the, the the fake so shuffle. Are watching, I don't think that. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, no, when I do the fake shuffle joke, I call it the pothole. And I say because it looks like go. you're doing something, but nothing ever happens. Uh, and that's kind of how it is here. And so that's the challenges we're facing now. That and then of course we've had challenges since with hurricanes and pandemics. But uh, the idea is that one day we'll have such a venue and we'll we'll be able to we'll bring you in for sure. You don't have to audition for me, Harrison. Well, I, and I cannot believe that. It was 2012. So that's probably why I was. Uh, I would look through my, my emails, but well, when I met you in person, which I, I if I called it an, an audition, I'm sorry, way, I, because I, I already I, knew I, you were great. I, I'm I'm uh, the only reason I'm bringing it up is because it was so cool where you were like, I have this thing. It's called Skype. And if I can I can virtually put you in to in front of the audience and we worked this out. And so 2012, we accidentally did the first zoom show. I, I invented it. I invented eight Skype. years yeah. before. I invented yeah, the co-credit. internet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if you know, but no, I actually, uh, when I first met you was when we were hanging out at the little diner after the Monday night magic. I mean, oh, when yeah. I first met you in person and uh, you had, you had just performed and uh, we were at that, that, lo- that diner there. Now I've, I've performed there a couple of times since, but I don't think it was the same night. I think I was just there watching. And uh, I remember um, someone, we were having a conversation and someone said, do you think he's really gay? And I said, I have no idea. And my sister said, well, based on the way he was talking to me, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah so so my sister got to know you a little bit better than i did and so which made me jealous uh yeah no just in conversation no just like oh, okay. talking yeah yeah no, i like, was a perfect gentleman oh absolutely yeah yeah okay. no okay. that's not what impl- yeah no just in conversation at the diner oh, okay. um yeah oh, that so, diner you know i feel like they they when they were opening that diner they're like you could either make thousands of things not well or you can make 10 things really, really well. What do you want to do? And they're like, thousand things. For sure, a thousand things. So you remember the diner well. Yeah, that oh, was the regular yes. hangout my, joint, right? My After. whole intestinal system will never forget it. So, um, and and that's where and that's where I really got to see. It was very inspiring to me because I could I could tell right then seeing you on stage that this was someone who didn't have to rely on magic that you could come out and entertain the crowd. And of course you, you did magic in the show, but you didn't have to, you, you could have just entertained because there were several magicians on the show. So what, what do you think was your inspiration? Like, in other words, you, if you had never touched magic, we all know that you're a gifted comedian and you could have an outstanding career just as a comedian. So what is it? Why magic? My question is why magic? Yeah. I mean, I, I started out as a magician. I was a kid magician I was five years old. I loved doing magic. I started going to magic camp when I was a little bit older than that. Um, I met some of my best friends in the world there. This is um, Tannins? Tannins Magic Tannins Camp? Magic Camp, which registration opened, uh, just opened. Uh, TanninsMagicCamp.com. I love to promote it because it honestly changed my life. Um, and, I, I, you know, we always tell the kids you're going to meet your best friends here. And every kid I think is like, really? Is that possible? Like, we're here for a week. I don't know these people. And then by the end of the week, they're like, oh, my God, you're correct. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's it's really a magical place, uh, no pun intended, because we're all weird. We're all a bunch of weirdos, and we all do this weird thing, and for one week, you get to actually be cool for doing this weird thing. Like, that, the fact that you know this card trick doesn't make you a weirdo at Magic Camp. It makes you the cool kid, uh, and I think it's really, it's a safe space um, for for you to be your full magic weird self, um, which I think is really cool and, and, and very special. Um, but yeah, I, I, I loved magic. I always have loved magic. Uh, comedy didn't come till later. Uh, I was always like funny while I was doing magic. And it was a nice vehicle to learn that skill in some ways of 
um, you know, and the magicians that I liked watching the most were comedy magicians. A lot of them. Um, Amazing Jonathan. I remember seeing on Comedy Central and being like, what is this? Like, this is crazy. Like, I didn't know you were allowed to do that. Uh, perhaps not the best influence when you're a child. Cause I remember my first ever, co- I think my first competition act at magic camp or my second was definitely not appropriate for the age that I was, <laughs> um, you know, and obviously you see like David Copperfield do all of his specials and you're like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Like I, this magic is so special. Um, and then when I got to college, I was doing the mystery lounge, which was in Harvard square. So not very far from my dorm and I was doing it every week. And so I, that, that the where the mystery lounge was was the third floor of a Chinese restaurant, but in the other days of the week it was a comedy club. So there was this little interest of like, what do you? I've never I've never seen live stand up. Like I kind of want to see this. So that's floating around. Uh, and then uh, a friend of mine called me up and was like, Hey, we do this month. Uh, we uh, sorry yearly uh, magic show. It was once a year. It was every spring semester. Uh, you want to do magic on the show? And I had said, you know, can I try stand up? It's a it's a stand up show. It was called Demon Comedy Fest. Uh, so I, I, I asked if I could do stand-up. He said, sure. We had people trying things out. And that was the first time I ever did just kind of stand-up. Where I, just, I, I wrote jokes. I sat down at my computer and I wrote jokes. Um, and I went on stage and that was, it was like a drug. I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Because when I was doing magic, I was dressing like I was in a country club. Uh, I had to be ser- perfectly clean. So many magic shows, even for all adults, have to be clean. And all of a sudden, I said curse words, and I kind of dressed like myself, and I was sharing my opinions. And I was like, "Whoa, this is this is really cool." Uh, and at that point, I was eighteen. Uh, everyone was it's it's Harvard, so everybody's applying for these lofty internships. They're like, "I'm going to be at the Supreme Court this summer," and you're like, "Oh, I was just going to be a lifeguard, but okay, that's that's pretty good." So I'm like, "I need to apply or do something impressive." So I'm looking all over and I realized Mad Magazine has an internship. I'm like, that's an internship that I want to do. And I applied and somehow I got it. And all of a sudden I'm working at Mad Magazine the summer of my freshman year. I'm really interested in comedy. Always have been. Now I have some of the best comedy writers of all time helping me. Like they're standing over my shoulder. It's like comedy boot camp. I'm handing out flyers on the corner uh, all the way uptown to, you know, two hours of flyering, what we call barking, gets me five minutes on a comedy show at this place called the Underground Lounge. I don't even know if it's still there. And uh, also I'm doing these like five minute spots and I'm doing stand up. So that summer was really sort of the conversion where I was like, oh my God, I love this comedy thing. And uh, came back to campus. I started a stand up group on campus. Um, the Harvard College Stand Up Comic Society. So it was Harvard College Sucks was the acronym and uh, they were thrilled. Um, but yeah, so that, that's sort of that, that evolution from sort of being funny while doing magic to straight up comedy. And during that summer, to make a long story long, um, I was putting sponge balls in my back pocket right before my five minute set. And a comedian goes, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, there's sponge. It's a magic trick. Like but the show, the set's not going well. I'm going to end with the magic trick. So I end with like this big, you know, big applause. And he's like, you're never going to learn stand up if you have a safety net. So you got to take that out of your pocket. And it was really scary, but I did. I listened to him. Uh, I'm still friends with that comic to this day. And um, and that was really good advice. So I kept them really separate for a long time because I was like, I'm never going to learn how to be a proper stand up comedian until uh, I do it without any, any other, without crutches, without a, without without crutch, a safety yeah. net. And so they were really separate for a long time, but I love magic. And so, you know, th- there was a part of me where, you know, I I loved magic. The thing I, I disliked the most about magic was the lack of originality. That's sort of where the URL terrible thing came from. And I, at a certain point, it's like, I need to put my money where my mouth is. Uh, can I design a show according to these new rules that I've, I've found in the stand-up community and being part of that community? Um, and so I started putting them together. And so I'm still at a weird point where it's, it's, it's weird to market yourself as two different things and explaining that to people and producers and bookers and clients. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. So I'll still go and do a lot of stand-up shows. Um, when I'm running around New York, a lot of those shows are mostly stand-up. Um, but I love going off and doing magic and I love the show that I built and can't wait to build another one. Um, so that's, that's hopefully a good explanation of how, the, how, the, how one led to the other. 
Absolutely. And now you're in New York now, but you're yeah. performing often in Vegas. And I'd say I'm assuming a huge step in your career is Cirque du Soleil. So can you talk a little bit about that process and how all of a sudden you ended up headlining as the first magician to ever headline Cirque du Soleil? Yeah. Spoiler. I'm back in New York. Um, I <laughs> <laughs> No, it was, uh, it was really crazy. I was running around New York, um, as, as I've always done. And I get a call saying, hey, we have this new Cirque du Soleil show, which I had heard about. Um, I knew they were developing. I, I heard about it pretty early on in the process. Um, there's this thing called Mad Apple. It's at New York, New York. And it's a New York themed Cirque du Soleil show. Um, we want to put stand up comedy in it because New York is synonymous with like stand up comedy. Uh, the best comedy clubs in the world. Uh, at least some of them are here, I would say. Um, and so they, instead of clowns, let's do stand up comedy. Let's really do it for real, like uncensored what you would get in a New York comedy club. And uh, they, the first day that they have previews with live, a live audience, they had rehearsals for a long time. The first day they go, Hey, we need the, what the comic in the show. We, we need a fill in. Um, and I was like, Oh, okay, sure. This is the call I get on Saturday. They fly me out Sunday morning, the next morning. Uh, and I'm on the phone with them at like three o'clock in the morning being like, I don't have any plane tickets. I'm actually waking up at in an hour to come here. The, the thing gets into my inbox. I schlep all the way to Las Vegas. They immediately show me uh, how not to die in the elevator because I'm supposed to come up this elevator. Uh, and I'm in the show for one day. I bring like three pairs of underwear. I do the show. All of MGM and Cirque is there. And they go, hey, you, you mind staying? We have another show Tuesday. Do you mind staying? The other comic's going to be back. But like, you want to want to stick around for another day? Okay, sure. I have three pair of underwear, so it'll last. <laughs> so I, I stick around till Tuesday. I do that show. Uh, they come up to me. They say, hey, we actually have live shows all the way through Saturday. Do you want to stay to the end of the week? Okay, I'm going to have to do laundry, but I'll figure out how to do it. I get to the end of the week. Uh, I get on the plane to go back to New York. I'm like, I got, I got stuff in New York. Um, I, I get on the plane. By the time I land, they sent me a contract for a year and a half. Uh, they're like, you're going to be the headliner of the show. Um, wow. So is that pretty much that slow and that fast? I mean, it takes a lot of time to get to a position where you can can do that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, what, that, was your, that, what was your reaction when you received that? Uh, there was not enough time to process. I mean, right? My, yeah. It was my fiance at the time, now wife, but my fiance at the time. I have to tell her, hey, so do you think we should move to Las Vegas? Because I have this offer, um, and it seemed like a really cool opportunity. I mean, they've never had a comedian or comedy magician headline the show. It's an 85 minute show um, for most of the run that I did. I did 650 performances. I, I did about 30 to 40 minutes of that show. So uh, if, you, and if you look on the website, it was Mad Apple starring Harrison Greenbaum. The only other time that's ever happened where they name a star was Chris Angel. Um, so uh, that's fun. Uh, just me and Chris together to the end. And uh, <laughs> which I'm going to ask you more about that in, in a little while, actually. Um, so, yeah, so it's been it was a wild adventure. I mean, it was 20, a 20 million dollar show or something crazy like that. I forget. You, you got to Google it. Um, it was it was a big production Cirque du Soleil show in a twelve hundred seat theater. We did it twice a night, um, five nights a week. So 10 shows a week. And then I would run off on the off nights and do like the comedy cellar at the Rio um, and kind of run around to the comedy clubs that were in Vegas um, on my off night. So I was still doing at least 14 shows a week. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a crazy adventure meeting all the magicians out there. That was really wonderful. All the comedians out there. Um, so yeah, it was a wild chapter. So I'm going to ask you, I guess, one more question, and then we're going to wrap up this segment. Um, and for those that want a little more content, I want to keep Harrison around, but he has been so clean throughout this entire performance because knowing that this is for the IBM Facebook page, but I want to give him a chance to be a little uncensored and have a few questions that I want to ask and give him an opportunity to uh, <laughs> be a little more, a little more dressed down, a little more himself. Um oh. So in in a moment, how much but I'll more do... dress down can I be? I'm in a t-shirt. You're in a t-shirt. Uh, What's going to happen uh, on this Twitch stream? My God. I'll, I'll give it an outro and then you can tune into my my Twitch channel. But my question Hopefully we're is, wearing I... clothing. It's evidently that's optional. It um it it will be, it, yeah. <laughs> in just a moment, yes. Uh, which you know, starting with my first question, I mean, who knows? But uh, so 
I looked at your schedule that you posted on Instagram, and uh, I think there may be a few openings. So I want to entice you um, to come to the IBM convention in Tacoma. And if you're there, I will be actually hosting a live version of this show with like a panel where we're going to film it live at the IBM convention. And I would love to have you as a guest. So you have my invitation and I'm extending the opportunity to have you book there. Uh, if you become available, if, if you could be, we would love to book you for the Tacoma convention, at least if nothing else, be a guest again on my show, um, but live in front of the magician audience. So that is my invitation to you. Ooh. I don't know if your schedule will allow, but uh, the next convention is in Tacoma in Ooh, July. Let's talk. Is it July? Did I get the dates? Well, I think July, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that, that sounds yeah. really, really fun. Yeah, that would that would be fabulous if you're available to have you. Um, and you know, just to have you there and to hang out would be would be phenomenal. Uh, yeah, but no, that sounds awesome. So let's say thank you and huge round of applause for the reason this is all happening, actually, because of your brilliant idea, um, ladies and gentlemen of the IBM. You're the one who came up with the swords, though. I yeah, well, you didn't have the swords behind you, so yeah, it's more it's a more dangerous version. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Harris.